Hey all, welcome to ShareTrack. This is Raj here. Today's topic is going to be hepatitis, and uh, that's again H hepatitis B uh, is a, a kind of a infection that people have been struggling against for quite a while. Uh, it's not quite a retrovirus, but it does behave like one. And some people end up getting chronic hepatitis, and uh, there's a search on for a functional cure. And today I'm going to talk about uh, this particular disease, uh, how it manifests, and there are four therapies that are currently being watched by the FDA, and uh, three of them are functional cures and one is not. Uh, we'll see what happens with them. So this is an introductory video on hepatitis B. We're just initiating the coverage. Let's get started. Well, friends, as I mentioned, there are four gene therapies that will yield uh, potentially yield results in the next 12 months. Three are from universities and one is, one is from uh, Gilead Sciences. And for today, let's understand hepatitis first. Let's get started with uh, the definition. So first, I want to explain a concept that you need to understand in order to grasp how hepatitis B works. And uh, it's the concept of the NTCP receptor that is on the surface of uh, hepatocytes in our liver. NTCP stands for sodium taurocholate uh, co-transporting polypeptide, where the N stands for sodium, whose uh, scientific formula is NA. So you take an N from there, and that's the way the acronym is formed here, NTCP. And uh, in a healthy individual, the normal function of the NTCP is related to bile acid transport in the liver, NTCP is a membrane protein expressed on the surface of hepatocytes, which are the main cells in the liver. Its primary function is to actively transport bile acids from the blood into hepatocytes. And bile acids are important for the digestion and absorption of fat in the small intestine. NTCP plays a crucial role in uptake of bile acids from the blood into the hepatocytes. And bile acids are produced in the liver and stored in the gallbladder. When needed for digestion, bile acids are released into the small intestine to help emulsify and absorb dietary fats. And after bile acids have assisted in fat absorption, they are reabsorbed in the small intestine and transported back to the liver through the bloodstream. And NTCP facilitates the reuptake of these bile acids by hepatocytes, contributing to a process known as enterohepatic circulation. So NTCP along with other transporters and regulatory mechanisms help maintain the balance of bile acids in the liver and the balance is essential for proper digestion and absorption of fats as well as the synthesis of bile. When NTCP's normal function is primarily associated with bile acid transport, it also serves as the entry receptor for hepatitis B virus or HBV. The virus exploits NTCP to gain entry into hepatocytes and initiate its replication cycle as mentioned in the context of hepatitis B infection. Hepatitis B virus uses uh, the NTCP uh, receptor to gain entry into hepatocytes and the primary cells of the liver and the entry process involves several steps. So the first thing is that the hepatitis B virus first circulates in the bloodstream and comes into contact with the hepatocytes in the liver. The virus specifically recognizes and binds to the NTCP receptor on the surface of the hepatocytes. This initial attachment is a crucial step in the entry process. After binding to NTCP, the virus is internalized uh, into the hepatocyte through a process called uh, endocytosis. This in, uh, involves the engulfment of the virus particle by the host cell membrane forming a vesicle. And once inside the host cell, the vesicle containing the virus undergoes a process called as uncoating and the viral envelope is removed and the viral genome, which is partially double-stranded DNA, is released into the cytoplasm of the hepatocyte. In the cytoplasm, the viral DNA undergoes reverse transcription. This is a unique feature of HBV repli replication and the reverse transcription involves the synthesis of a complementary DNA or cDNA strand from the viral RNA template, followed by the synthesis of a second DNA strand, resulting in a double-stranded DNA molecule. Now, 
this particular uh, step is thwarted by using antiviral drugs uh, which prevent reverse transcription so that's one of the current uh, standard of care uh, medicines that's being used the double standard uh, viral dna is then transported uh, into the nucleus of the host cell and inside the nucleus the viral dna becomes part of the host cell's genetic material sometimes it may not integrate into dna and sometimes it does integrate into dna the dna integration part is optional once in the nucleus, the viral DNA serves as a template for the synthesis of messenger RNA. The host cell's machinery translates the viral mRNA into viral proteins and replication of the viral genome occurs. Assembly and budding takes place. Newly synthesized viral proteins and genomic uh, DNA are transported back uh, up to the cytoplasm and viral particles are assembled in the cytoplasm and they bud from the surface of the infected cell acquiring an envelope in the process. Mature viral particles are then released from the infected hepatocyte and the cycle continues. The interaction between the hepatitis B virus and the anti-CP receptor is a key step in the viral entry process and understanding these mechanisms is important for developing strategies to prevent or treat HBV infections. It's important to note that while HBV shares the reverse transcription step with retroviruses, it is not classified as a retrovirus due to difference in genetic material, family classification and the optional nature of DNA integration into the host cell genome. The reverse transcription is the, uh, in HPV is a unique feature among DNA viruses and contributes to its distinct classification as a hepadna virus. And the optional nature of DNA integration means that in many cases, the DNA of HPV may be in the cells but may not integrate with the host DNA. The current standard of care is to use antiviral medicines and regular diagnostics to monitor liver function and in extreme cases liver transplantation may be needed and the future is looking at four distinct therapy candidates in clinical trials. Out of these three are functional cures. So ANRS research center is looking at a combination therapy which is in a phase two clinical trial with an end date of 30th June 2024 then uh, that again is a functional cure. Then there is another uh, university, Sun Yat Sen University, which is looking at a combination therapy, which is not a functional cure, but is in phase two and uh, is expected, expected to complete studies this month, which is uh, December uh, 2023. The third is from Hanover Medical School with hepatitis B immunoglobin from human. And uh, it's a monotherapy, which is a functional cure that was to have completed uh, it's phase two in August 2023, which is the August that we just went past. So after this video is done, I'm going to be searching to find out what happened with this particular therapy. Did it succeed or has it got to go to phase 2B or 2A or something like that? I'll check that out and get back to you in a subsequent video in one of these weeks. Uh, and uh, finally, we have a functional cure consisting of combination drugs from Gilead, which is in phase two with scheduled end date in January 2024. So I think uh, by end of January 2024, we should have the verdict on that. I think I, would, I should stop here at this point of time because I put a lot of information across to you. You can watch this video a couple of times to get an idea of what this uh, uh, HBV is all about. But before I leave, I would like to uh, uh, tell you that there is he hepatitis A, B and C, three varieties. Hepatitis A is typically short and it goes away, but B and C can have a tendency to linger around in uh, some patients, especially if the patient is a child under the age of six years of age, then there's a good chance that it could become chronic. But for older people, they are able to more or less uh, dodge hepatitis uh, A and uh, B and C uh, to a good extent. So not everybody who gets hepatitis B might end up uh, being chronic. That's my understanding currently. But if that changes, I'll let you know. Uh, I'm also studying this for the first time in order to bring it across to you. And guys, you know that I'm not a scientist or a doctor. This is just an information video. And uh, whenever you are in doubt that you have hepatitis B or something like that, go to your healthcare provider. That's the first place where you have to check. They have trained for a long time in order to be of service to you when you're not well. And they not only know about hepatitis B, but other diseases also which could share the common symptoms. So they are the right people to diagnose it. So I would always say the first call is to be uh, the healthcare provider. 
follow their instructions and you should be doing fine. With that, my friends, I'd like to end this video here. And I'm hoping that uh, you would uh, not hesitate to press the uh, like button because it helps uh, YouTube algorithm to propagate our video to other people that are looking for content like this. And um, uh, the, this uh, particular um, uh, video is also available to you in blog form in sharetrack.com. And uh, right now it's available in English. And in future, it could be available in French and uh, Spanish version, versions, depending on the ability of our volunteers to translate it. And it will be posted again uh, into the ShareTrek website in the French and Spanish section. And if you want to volunteer, please contact me from the contact form on our website and let me know which language you are willing to translate. Or if you have uh, web uh, design expertise and uh, you would like to improve our website and help me manage it, most welcome, please contact me. And with that, I would like to end this video. Bye for now.